so today, getting into our topic at hand, I wanted to go over in some more detail about x-ray and neutron methods. Um, probably would have fit a little bit better before NMR. I'll probably switch that in the future. Um, but if you remember, we talked about using x-rays for x-ray crystallography very briefly, but x-rays can be used for other types of measurements as well. Um, fits with October's wide through this 12 foot skeleton, if any of you guys put up your Halloween decorations um, as well. So getting into, since these techniques are more specialized, especially with the sources for x-rays and neutrons, I think it's worth discussing or having a lecture on these methods. Um, so today, goals get into details with x-rays and neutrons. And these, again, if you remember the wavelengths for x-rays and also neutrons, we're getting at atomic level resolution. So I would say 0 0.1 to 25 angstroms are possible with these methods. So you should be thinking of x-ray methods, neutron methods, and electron methods are ways to get down to these atomic scale resolutions. So getting X-rays being the region of the electromagnetic spectrum that can get down to those levels. So those all using scattering methods, using diffraction methods, you can do that with all three types of those uh, particles, um, but obviously there are different uh, fundamental particles there. Um, another goal is to understand like the specialized means of producing x-rays and neutrons. And specifically, we're going to go into a little bit of detail about small angle scattering. And this can be done with x-rays or neutrons and understand like what, so this is small angle neutrons scattering is SANS or SACS is small angle x-ray scattering and understanding like what that data or when you see plots from these small angle scattering methods, what that means. Um, and finally, this is also related to a question in the problem set, like x-rays versus neutrons. Why would you choose to use one over the other? Um, so with our instrument schematic, the repetitive nature of taking an instrumentation courses, we always go over uh, these aspects. Um, the specialized sources that we're going to be discussing include synchrotrons and accelerators, um, nuclear reactors, um, and spallation sources. So again, these are very different from how many of the optical techniques were like, oh, you use this lamp, you use this other lamp, you use this other or laser. Um, this is why it's more specialized techniques. Um, the samples, uh, we'll talk about the limitations of these techniques, but it's more of a surface-based method. And um, specifically with neutrons, um, using, uh, spelling this wrong, deuterated samples for neutrons. And then, Going along with specialized sources, specialized detectors are included where we'll talk about using gas scintillation, um, base methods for, for detection, and then also uh, specialized semiconductors that are a little different than what we've been using for detecting uh, UV to IR photons. Cool. So yeah, jumping into x-rays, we talked about a little bit of, we talked a little bit when we went over crystallography, some of the possible sources for x-rays. I wanna go into a some more detail about that since they're specialized. That in that last lecture, I guess it was two and a half weeks ago, a week and a half ago or so, we discuss x-ray tubes um, where you can generate 
X-rays by bombarding a metal target with electrons. So you produce electrons at a cathode. And you accelerate them through a high potential difference. Let's say around 100 kilovolts potential difference to hit in your metallic anode. So this anode uh, is usually, I guess you'll see elements in the first row of the periodic table of sodium, potassium, you also see tungsten being used, molybdenum um, for the metal. And based on the metal that you're using, you'll produce different energies. Uh, and this all has to do with the inner shell electrons. So when those electrons hit your metal surface, what they're going to do is eject or either eject or excite inner shell electrons. So from the physics perspective, these are usually level, labeled as like the K, the L, and go through the alphabet here, um, as opposed to the outer shell electrons. So you can see here with these different energy transitions between these levels where this is our nucleus, the different inner shell electrons, you'll get different energies um, present there. And when the electrons are being accelerated through this voltage, or this potential difference, um, there's a description of what the shortest wavelength you can achieve is. And this is called the Duane Hunt Law. And that shortest wavelength ends up being 12,398 divided by your potential here, where this value comes from some constants related to like Planck's constant and uh, the metal that you're using here. So this is the shortest wavelength, but you can also produce longer wavelengths because some energy is lost while the electron is traveling through this potential difference. Um, it can interact with um, any remaining gas molecules that are present. So because of that, you can end up with a band spectrum, um, unless you have a very idealized X-ray tube, um, you might have some lines present. So this energy lo loss results in the band spectrum. So at the end, I refer to um, the chapters in uh, in the Skoog book where that talk about x-ray methods and they have some nice plots showing typically you'll end up with some if you end up with a band spectrum that like there's some idealized highest energy peaks that might show up from these energy level transitions within the metal that you're using but due to that energy loss that's why this broadens out here. So x-ray tubes are nice because they can be a benchtop source um, of x-rays. Um, also within x-ray tubes, those can be used for uh, another type of source using x-ray fluorescence, where you'll use an x-ray tube or another source to have a primary beam of x-rays. And then that, those primary x-rays generate secondary x-rays by exciting electrons in here, which then relax down and generate fluorescence. So this would be fluorescence from inner shell electrons. So this would be secondary x-rays that are going to be lower energy than a primary x-ray source that causes those excitations.
Um, historically, another source of x-rays were radioactive sources to produ produce x-rays. This is why early research using x-rays and people being unaware of um, the damage that they could cause uh, led to many earlier researchers dying young, getting cancer early. We'll talk about this type of damage later in the talk. Um, but uh, for radioactive sources, you'll have alpha or beta emission processes. Uh, so remembering like alpha and beta emission has to do with like how, what electrons, what protons, neutrons are changing within the radioactive process. Um, when these emission processes occur, they leave the uh, nucleus in an excited state. And then when they decay to ground state, they emit gamma rays, which are indistinguishable, which are the same type of wavelengths as x-rays. Uh, so the nice thing with radioactive sources is that these are line spectra as opposed to x-ray tubes or x-ray fluorescence that are more prone to being, this would also be a band spectrum. So if you, just like using a white light versus a laser source in using visible or UV or IR uh, optical techniques, here for x-rays, using a radioactive source would be similar to using like a laser source in the visible region that you get a nice line spectra, you know exactly what wavelength you're using here. So for example, commonly used is like iron 55, that in its uh, decay process, it'll produce a 2.1 angstrom line there. And finally, the last source that I wanna discuss is synchrotrons. So with the synchrotron, you're uh, producing X-ray radiation by accelerating electrons. In a radio field or radio frequency radio radiation, just like when we're talking about NMR, I'm abbreviating radio frequency with RF and you bend and control those electrons with a magnetic field. And in this pro process of accelerating electrons, having them curve, we're not gonna go into all the physics behind that, but what happens is you produce collimated X-rays. So again, collimation similar to lasers where you're not having the X-rays spread out or diverge collimated, they're going to stay the same size. Uh, you won't need to use optics to try to focus that since uh, it's difficult to have optics that are compatible with focusing x-rays that well. And so the key thing here is you have collimated x-rays. And also the second thing that's key is that they're brighter. And by brighter means like much higher intensity compared to what you can achieve by X-ray tubes, fluorescence, or radioactive sources. So if you're trying to look at something that's rare, if you're trying to use low concentrations, synchrotrons can provide you that high intensity collimated excitation uh, at a single wavelength compared to uh, these other methods. So with synchrotrons, if you really want the best synchrotrons, higher intensity, you actually have to travel somewhere to have a good enough x-ray source with a synchrotron. And I wanted to point out that Case Western, we have 
we have a, a synchrotron, but it's really at Brookhaven National Labs in uh, New York. But we have, CASE has a center there um, in the fact that we have our own beam line that is managed by a professor in the nutrition department. Um, Jack, I don't know if you've interacted with this professor at all, um, but it's been over 20 years. It sounds like he's had funding to help support this beam line. And actually this Brook Brookhaven National Lab, you can see that this national synchrotron light source, that's what's pictured here. You can see how large it is um, to accelerate those electrons to focus it with the magnetic fields to then get high intensity. Um, that in each of these buildings around here, there's multiple beam lines present. Um, and you can see that noted in the light source that it has two, that actually the first synchrotron that was at Brookhaven has been retired and that's where Case's line was originally at. And we even got, obviously we've been successful enough that then we were able to keep our beam line there um, uh, and into the new thing. But yeah, okay. yeah. Jack notes that um, Professor Chance is also the Vice Dean of Research. Yeah, when I was on his webpage, it seems like he's one of the higher up, bigger deal people. So um, I'm guessing he's not teaching classes that often in the nutrition department and the like, but he, there's a whole set of staff, I think around four or five people associated with Case Western, but actually are working at Brookhaven to maintain this line. So it's nice that we have Case represented there and the specific beam line that we have is for doing x-ray uh, footprinting, which we won't go into detail about, um, but that's like how we've talked about fingerprinting uh, with many of these techniques uh, where you're getting specific peaks or signatures that can identify structure or identify the molecule. That's what this beam line is specialized for, but there's many different beam lines here that will be used for XPS or these other techniques that we'll mention. Um, getting time at a synchrotron takes some scheduling. It might even take like writing grant proposals um, to then to collaborate with people at Brookhaven. Um, and some of the other sources that we'll talk about for neutrons as well, it's a similar uh, method. But because synchrotrons are like a large infrastructure, uh, these are typically run by national labs with many universities associated with them. And even if you're not associated like, okay, let's say you want to do um, like XPS instead of like this x-ray footprinting. It doesn't mean that you're just limited to be using the beam line that um, CASE has. Like you can sign up and collaborate. It just takes, you have to have your sample ready. You have to be prepared and have a question ready to do your measurement because there's a waiting list, there's limited time. And even when you go to Brookhaven, they have on their website like details of like, where you could stay at the National Lab, they have like their own like details about cafeteria and food because most people when they do these measurements, like they'll bring a team in, schedule back to back time so you can have measurements 24 hours um, so you can get as much data as you can here uh, to then bring back and analyze when you're on campus. Um, so that's a little bit about how measurements and synchrotrons work. I think Austin mentioned he might have collaborated or worked with some time at Argonne. Um, and he could probably comment a little bit on that sometime, or I don't know if anyone else here has worked on synchrotrons. Um, but also mentioning that US isn't the only one that like, they all have acronyms. European Union, Large Hadron Collider actually has, well, in a physics department, we mostly think about investigating some atomic particles there. The energies of producing and accelerating all those particles also produce x-rays. So there are um, synchrotron lines, beam lines for x-ray research at the LHC as well. Cool. Any questions with the x-ray sources, uh, synchrotrons at all? So with specialized high energy sources, you also need specialized compatible selection and detection of those x-rays as well. So just noting that if you want to filter or select x-rays, you can't use like something as 
simple as like dyes and plastic that we use for optical filtering, that these need to be specialized and are somewhat difficult to do. That actually metals themselves are used to, like zirconium, molybdenum, are used as filters for specific cutoffs, but it is quite difficult to do. And selecting x-rays are typically done by monochromators that are based on Todd's favorite equation of the Bragg diffraction. So um, and this is in problem one of problem set three, gets into some of Bragg diffraction. So um, if you select a specific crystal like silicon dioxide, but also others um, with specific lattice patterning. You could use Bra the concept of Bragg diffraction where Bragg's equation is this here, where N is an integer, D is the spacing, this is the angle that the incoming light is passing through. That the fact that you have this integer value here and the angle, you can get different selection of different wavelengths here, taking advantage of this equation. So you place a crystal on the goiniometer and controlling the angle will select the wavelength that you're interested in. So this is how monochromators work for x-rays um, as opposed to using like prisms or gratings. I guess your crystal is acting somewhat as a grating. Yeah, I guess it's used, acting as a grating to have constructive or destructive interference based on Bragg's equation here. Um, using the goiniometer and the rotation is key. Um, that being able to rotate and have a very specific angle and doing this at the right speeds and rates um, is important. Um, so this is typically with commercial uh, equipment. So you have that high control. And in some of my reading, they might even rotate very fast. 1400 degrees per minute um, and having that timing and knowing what wavelength is passing through given a specific rotation um, takes a lot of optimization. So that's why commercial equipment is used. Um, something to note with the monochromators and also x-rays in general is that um, air interferes with x-rays. So these are typically done either in vacuum or we discussed helium earlier, how it's used for cooling with NMR, but here helium is used within the monochromator or the instrument itself to have um, an atmosphere where there's less interaction between the x-rays, I guess an inert atmosphere where x-rays won't interact with the helium gas that's present. Um, it's another instrumental application uh, of our limited supplies of helium. So that's selection and moving on to the detection of x-rays. Um, you may think of, when I think of x-ray detection, I think of like the early work of uh, using pho photographic materials. Um, and phosphorescent screens as well. And I think I should, I need to know more of Case's history, but I know that the physics department has some role in the history of x-ray detection. I know Professor Mathur would give all, has all those details I need to find out that I think in the physics department was one of the early x-rays of human hand. Maybe you guys know better. Yeah, so Annie says Dayton Miller. So I need to know that history better. You guys probably know it more than me. Um, that we were involved with early x-ray detection on film. But nowadays, and even like I've seen this through, I guess, my limited lifetime of going to the dentist and always having to wait for film to develop, 
versus now where there's digital x-ray detection and you can get like images right away of your teeth that we have digital digital detection um, with where that's possible is semiconductors as the technology um, has become more developed and less expensive that these are usually lithium um, based detectors. Um, so you'll hear a lithium drifted. That's horrible handwriting. Lithium drifted silicon detectors. So this is silicon with lithium doped in it. And there's also germanium lithium based semiconductor semiconductor detectors. And for biophysical instrumentation and use, these are typically cooled with liquid nitrogen. Um, uh, so those are, I'd say these are becoming increasingly common because of the cost and the technology of semiconductors. But some other x-ray detectors that are not photographic include um, gas-filled transducers. Where when x-rays hit the gas that's within the detector, it'll cause ionization. So these are typically inert gases. So the right-hand side of the periodic table, argon, xenon, and the like. And once those gases are ionized, the x-rays are high energy enough to kick off one of those inner shell electrons. So you have a charged gas, then you use, um, you detect the potential uh, uh, produced by those charges. So um, you detect the voltage. First, it has to be amplified, and then uh, it's electronically detected. So that's the second type of detector. So one is the semiconductors, two is the gas filled transducers. And the third one I wanna mention um, are scintillation counters. So these are uh, produced fluorescence. So if you have Sodium iodide doped with thallium iodide, TL. Preparing this lecture made me look at so many elements in the periodic table that I don't think about. Um, so this thallium iodide that's doped in there when it x-rays hit it, they produce phosphorescence or fluorescence. And that fluorescence is then detected on a PMT, a photomultiplier tube. So the use of the PMT is because it's very sensitive to a low number of photons. So, and then it multiplies those. So high sensitivity, thinking back to some of the um, detectors, 1D detectors that we've uh, discussed with the fluorescence lectures, those still show up with x-rays where you can see like, okay, x-rays to an optical, a visible area or maybe UV area of electromagnetic spectrum for the fluorescence that then is amplified by the PMT. And then you can also see with the gas filled transducers, again, there's an amplification here that improves the sensitivity. So with all those components of uh, x-ray instrumentation, are there any questions? So okay, we talked about how x-rays are produced, detected, controlled, but there's a range of different types of spectroscopies that are used um, that take advantage of x-rays. So being aware, you'll see a lot of x-ray techniques people will just I often see them like grouped together uh, or and keeping all the acronyms straight 
there's not good terminology for a lot of these spectroscopies. So be aware that they do take advantage of different energetic processes with how x-rays interact with materials. Um, so the first one I want to mention is um, x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. or XPS. This is one of the nice ones that just has one acronym typically. Um, and that's what this diagram here is showing, that you eject a core shell electron and detect its energy. Um, and this is based on the photoelectric effect If you think back to chapter one and the introduction of your quantum chemistry or quantum physics class, um, we talk about the photoelectric effect there. Um, and so you have your x-ray come in, you can see this core shell electron here in terms of chemistry with the 1s orbital or in terms of the physics acronyms of the k-shell electron that's ejected. And based on the energy that you detect, um, this is your bonding energy, your binding energy. Uh, this is your frequency that you detect and Planck's constant. So this can be related to your wavelength or your frequency that you detect, your kinetic energy, and then your work function. Here that's based on the chemistry of, the, of what this is being ejected from. So based on this, based on the kinetic energy that you can quantify, you can tell, you can gain information about um, the element that electron was from. Um, you can also get information about the oxidation state and also the surroundings. So this is all chemical information about your sample using the x-rays, the energy of the electron based on x-ray excitation. So here you're using x-rays as a source and the electron as what you're, what you're detecting there. So another technique, x-ray absorption spectroscopy. And this is a guy that has way too many acronyms. Uh, the obvious one based on calling it this would be XAS, but this is also energy dispersive spectroscopy. You'll hear it referred to as EDS. Energy dispersive X-ray absorption, uh, EDXA, and there's that field for some reason they haven't agreed upon like what acronym that you're using. Um, so this is taking advantage of looking at the absorption, just like a UV vis uh, that we talked about way back when we started into the instrumentation. You're looking at the absorption of X-rays. Um, and this is a fingerprinting technique when people label that for the specific peaks that you see. Um, and the analogy to UV vis uh, stands because you can use the Beer-Lambert law uh, to quantify this. If you think back to our UV vis discussion. Um, another uh, technique is OJ spectroscopy. 
named after a French scientist, so that's why you don't say auger spectroscopy and sound completely wrong about it. You say OJ spectroscopy, and when I learned about this technique, uh, there's a big picture of orange juice to remember, like, say, like OJ, OJ spectroscopy um, to remember how to call that or the French pronunciation of that. Um, so this was actually, it's named after the French scientist uh, who discovered it, but he discovered it concurrently with uh, Lise Meitner. So we should also call it, possibly call it Meitner spectroscopy as well since she got screwed out of a Nobel Prize as well, also screwed out of the name of OJ spectroscopy, um, a little bit of science history there. And this is a somewhat special, well, it's not specialized. It takes place in multiple steps that there's a secondary electron that you're detecting. Um, so focus on this left-hand side of this figure here to explain the OJ process. That the first thing is, Step one is this core shell electron is being ejected from, an x-ray comes in, ejects a core shell electron. So this leaves a hole in the inner shell. A higher energy electron, core shell electron, then goes down, relaxes to fill that hole. Um, and this is what takes place in X-ray fluorescence, which is on the right-hand side here, where then it would relax and emit an X-ray. So this is X-ray fluorescence on the right-hand side. With the OJ process, what happens is when this relaxes down, the X-ray energy that is emitted actually kicks out another electron. So this is a second, okay, so the second step is this guy relaxing down, the third step is that energy from that relaxation kicking off this second electron. So with OJ spectroscopy, you're detecting the secondary OJ electron, and that gives information about the chemical um, um, aspects of your sample. So I'm going to write out these steps. The first one is like X-ray excitation ejects inner shell electron. The second step is an outer shell relaxes to the inner shell energy level. So this first step produces a hole. The second step it's going to fill the hole. And the third step here is that energy from that electron ejects a second electron. And then this guy is what is detected. And can give information about your sample. So this is, OJ spectroscopy is a competing process to this X-ray fluorescence here. So that's worth noting. Detect so here, if you're doing X-ray fluorescence, you're detecting the X-ray itself. If you're doing OJ spectroscopy, you're detecting the electron instead. So this is a range of x-ray spectroscopies that you may hear about. And when you're thinking about samples that x-ray spectroscopies can be applied to, this includes um, something to note is that most of these are surface selective. And as I mentioned, x-rays interact with gases in the atmosphere, so most are carried out in vacuum. Um, so because of that, some of these methods are actually added on to SEM techniques. Like if you want to do XPS on our campus, you would actually go to the Swage Lock Center and talk to them about like the add-on that they have to their SEM. Especially since like 
This is detecting electrons. Um, SEMs are have components there to control and detect electrons and focus those. Um, so because of these aspects of surface selected vacuum, the applications to biophysical samples include looking at metal binding proteins, so like that's where you want to get some elemental information, the oxidation state of the metals within metal binding proteins is important, the local surroundings. Um, and it's also used for uh, looking at macromolecular structures. So looking at uh, Self-assembled fibrils and fibers where the structure is very stable to then uh, withstand the vacuum environment. And that's also applied to like plant-based plant samples as well, where um, it's going to be robust enough to withstand like the vacuum environment or where you might be interested in the chemical makeup and the surface topography there. Any questions with x-ray spectroscopies? I have a question. Uh, in terms of deciding like when you're going to use the OJ process versus the x-ray process, um, so they both have to be in vacuum, right? Because you're mm -hmm. saying for the incoming x-rays, but like they look so identical that like when would you choose one over the other? Good question. I think if you're interested, I think the OJ gives some more fine details of these uh, outer energy levels um, that it can provide more fine details of the materials there. I think that's when you would pick the OJ process and it's a good question and I'm also going to like, I'll look into that in more detail and add it to the announcements or discussion section on the Canvas website. That's a good point. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? But yeah, that's also like, you'll see people, you see many of these techniques listed together. And sometimes it also has to do with like accessibility uh, of what instrumentation you have available to you to be able to do XPS versus absorption versus OJ or fluorescence as well. I think that's uh, some of the reasons people pick certain X-ray spectroscopies over other. Okay. Okay. So shifting gears, I do also want to mention um, small angle X-ray scattering. doesn't want me to walk right at the top, um, which I said earlier is abbreviated SACS. Um, and this uses a small, takes advantage of uh, the small wavelength of light that x-rays are at and is typically used half a nanometer to five, half an angstrom uh, with the scattering. And this is, we've talked about scattering before where here we're using the elastic scattering of x-rays. Um, and that elastic scattering can then be related to the number of particles, um, their size, and their concentration. and it interacts with the electron density of whatever you're scattering from. So earlier in the semester, we've talked about other techniques that use scattering to detect similar values or also other optical processes to detect like numbers of particles or size of particles or, or of molecules. So what were some of those techniques we've talked about earlier? 
that we can think of could be analogous to X-ray scattering, but in the visible region. Catherine says DLS. Was there another method similar to DLS that we discussed as well that got at the size of biomolecules? Maybe not using scattering. So also FCS would be similar to this, that it's using fluorescence, but you still get out based on fluctuations that you see. Similar to DLS, you can get numbers of particles, concentration, size, and the like. So the visible region we talked about DLS and FCS. So DLS compared to SACS would be, the problem is DLS would be for uh, larger particles. We're working in the visible region. Um, while with FCS, you have to label those. Um, that X-ray scattering uh, actually scatters from the electron density. So everything has electron clouds around it. Um, all molecules have electrons present. So you don't require any labeling using SACS. Um, so you're looking with SACS, you're looking at scattering differences between a biomolecule. Uh, the electron density is around 410 electrons per nanometer cubed. While with water, it's around 330 electrons per nanometer cubed. And that difference in electron density actually ends up seeing differences in the scattering with the biomolecules as opposed to the water. Um, also compared to NMR that we discussed last week, um, X-ray scattering has, uh, NMR has higher resolution uh, with atomic level structure but x-ray scattering can give you like overall shape compared to NMR. Um, so in small angle x-ray scattering, you're taking advantage of scattering from those electrons and this scattering intensity, we're gonna call S here. Well, actually no. Getting into some of the math behind the scattering intensity we're gonna say S is gonna be the modulus of momentum transfer. Where I'm using P to represent momentum here. So this is a momentum transfer of the electrons from uh, the X-rays uh, due to the biomolecule you're measuring. And the equation for this S is gonna be equal to four pi sine theta and the wavelength. So the wavelength here is gonna be for our X-rays. Um, the theta here is gonna be the angle between the incident and scattering beams. So two theta is the angle between the incident and scattering beams. So your excitation and your detected beams, what's the difference in the angle there? So you can get out this value S and just like in DLS, just like in FCS, you're gonna look at the fluctuations where those fluctuations in intensity of S is going to be, we're gonna average this over all orientations where this omega here is gonna be the orientations. And 
And how they detect this is done in the Fourier domain. domain. So this is the complex conjugate. That's what the asterisk is representing here. This is the Fourier transform. Here. So with these fluctuations that you average over all orientations in this momentum transfer, you can then plot you can then calculate I of S is going to be based on your incident fluctuations that you see times the exponent of negative one third, your radius of gyration squared and S squared. So this equation here is what's used in small angle x-ray scattering and it's called the Gounier equation. I'm guessing this is French as well. And if you look at this, if you plot the natural log of I of S versus S squared, if you take the natural log of this, then your slope is going to be your radius so you can get the size out of, um, of the biomolecule that you're measuring here. So that's what's used. You'll commonly see data plotted like this for x-ray uh, scattering. Um, so with this, um, just showing you, this is from it's worth looking at this tutorial paper that I've cited here. If you want more detail on small angle x-ray scattering, you can see you have your x-ray beam come in, your biomolecule sample is in solution here. And you can see the same equations that we were talking about on the previous slide that you detect on your scintillation device, your gas detector, or your semiconductor. You can see x-rays being scattered certain distances away, which you can then back calculate to get your theta value here. So if we took that equation, the Gunia equation that we, um, and you plotted it just IS versus S, these are typical curves here. Um, we're here, they're looking at a model uh, protein, BSA, that you guys have seen in multiple problem sets that's used as a, BSA is not known to aggregate in solutions. So they're saying there's like no interaction between that. And looking at biomolecules that either attract one another or repel one another. And if you go from this plot of uh, the fluctuations versus S here and plot it instead the lo natural log versus S squared, you can see that BSA falls uh, in between these two plots and that the fit to the slope where there's a linear regime here uh, spits out the radius of these different biomolecules. So you can see these are the different proteins for these uh, uh, that were, or different biomolecules that were being looked at, DNA, uh, BSA, and these different mutants that you can even plot this and uh, work with these equations to look at um, the particle shape. That's what's shown in panel D here, which they call P of R, which is gonna be the Fourier transform of um, I of S, can give you information about the shape here. You can see that this is extended out for the DNA um, and give like rough approximations of like, is this globular, linear, um, somewhere in between based on the shape. You can also work to get the particle volume out Um, the molecular mass. And this would be related to looking at um, IO. 
So your initial scattering, this is going to be your initial scattering. Um, and you would look at that com and compare it to BSA. Where BSA is going to be your like internal standard. That for different uh, so this I not if we go back to our equation over here, this is going to be your amplitude of your I of S versus S here. And this will tell you if you look at that compared to uh, BSA, that will tell you about information about the molecular mass. mass. Um, and you can even get folding stability. Um, holding or stability information of even getting more specialized of looking at S squared times I of S versus S will give you information about the confirmation. So there's a lot of mathematical ways to represent your data in x-ray scattering to get at um, what you're interested in your sample. That I'd say these Gounier plots are most common of what you see. But you'll see with x-ray scattering, it might become more specialized to look at different information um, as well. So I think the last, the last problem, second to last problem in the problem set three uh, is related to x-ray scattering. Um, understanding these type of plots down here. Uh, and interpreting those for a protein that's being folded at different pressures. Um, one last thing to note with x-rays is that they do have produce a lot of damage um, because they are high energy. They can, uh, with, we've been talking about like the ejection of electrons. Those electrons can interact with nearby materials. That can then form free radicals. And those free radicals can then cause damage. Or specifically over here, it can cause mutations in DNA. Uh, due to that damage and errors in the repair process and the like. Um, so I'd say from like a biomedical perspective, that's why x-rays are da uh, dangerous and can be related to cancers and mutations. Um, when we're thinking of biological samples uh, in a cuvette, I guess if you're doing like cell research, this would be of concern. Um, if you're looking at biomolecules in a cuvette, um, it's easier that you can to try to avoid this or at least reduce it. You can cool your sample that will decrease the diffusion length. Of your free radicals. Um, being strategic about like the intensity that you're using and the exposure times you're using in biological samples. Um, and also your spot size. So if you can use a collimated small spot size beam, that can reduce damage as well. So with the x-ray spectroscopy techniques that I was mentioning, you'll see those used quite frequently in material science research because their samples are much more uh, robust. And x-ray techniques can still irreversibly damage those samples, but it may not perturb them as greatly, uh, or if you have a high amount of that material, uh, it's easier to do x-ray techniques. When you're doing biological research with x-rays, you have to be uh, strategic about how much damage and how much that damage propagates to the surroundings of your sample. So be aware that that's of concern um, for x-ray techniques. Um, any question, more questions about x-rays? We have one more slide going over neutron techniques uh, but before I do that, any more questions or comments? Okay. So 
we go. Or someone on mute. Last thing before we go finish up for the day um, is that neutron techniques, like I mentioned, similar to, they can access similar wavelengths, similar energies to x-rays, but a fundamentally different particle. Instead of using a photon, you're using a neutron. Um, these are gonna be thermal neutrons, where the thermal aspect here is what's giving its uh, x, uh, the energy. And these will be similar wavelengths um, and they can be used for diffraction techniques just like we talked about a couple of weeks ago you can put a crystal in there look at the diffraction um, to get the atomic level structure of biomolecules using neutrons um, and you can also use it for small angle scattering methods um, so if they're having the same similar wavelengths, same type of interactions, why would you pick neutrons instead of x-rays? And the benefit of using neutrons is that instead of interacting with the electrons within your sample, they selectively interact with the, um, with the hydrogen nuclei. nuclei. So this produces, since every, uh, this produces better signal to noise ratios, and it also has better selectivity if you use deuterium instead of hydrogen. Uh, deuterium instead of hydrogen. So by selectively placing deuteriums within these deuterated solvents, um, so yeah, if you use D2O, you won't see, there's no solvents measured. Uh, you can also selectively label or, and put deuteriums within your biomolecule. So you look at selective hydrogen nuclei uh, within your sample. And this is also very sensitive to lighter elements as well. So thinking again, if you're interacting with nuclei, there's less nuclei present or more selective energetics with the nuclei that are there compared to all of the electrons that are present within a molecule. Um, and it's also can interact, you can control this uh, and scatter off, um, let's say, magnetic moments as well. So you can have higher select, I'd say selectivity is the key of why you would use neutrons as opposed to x-rays. Um, it's worth noting that, um, again, neutrons have specialized production that you can either produce them with a thermal nuclear reactor So things like uranium, californium, isotope fission uh, will give things with wavelengths around two angstroms or so. Uh, so obviously, Thermal nuclear reactors aren't like laying around and everywhere. So that's why I have this long list here of different neutron sources that are either thermal nuclear reactors, but there's also um, spallation sources. So this is when you hit, let's say, thallium or tungsten targets uh, with protons. And spallation is literally like those protons hit your sample so hard that they physically eject neutrons. Um, 
So you can see here with this long list of neutron sources within the United States, you can see like Oak Ridge National Lab that's down in Tennessee, that they have both like a thermal nuclear reactor source and also a spallation source. Um, and that again, just like with x-rays, if you wanna go travel to a synchrotron, uh, for neutrons, you also have to travel around and have access and schedule time um, on these reactors and sources to be able to do their, these measurements and hence why it's more of a specialized uh, technique. And then I would say like the detection is similar to x-rays that you can have those three different uh, three methods or techniques that we discussed base back there. So like the semiconductor, the scintillation, or um, the gas type of detectors. Since the energies that you're detecting, if you're detecting electrons that these neutrons kick off, or if you're detecting the energies of the neutrons themselves, um, they take advantage of these types of detections, a little bit more specialized. Neutrons also have the challenge in that they're neutral. Uh, so uh, there are some more specialized considerations with these detections of going from a neutral charge uh, to something that can be detected. So the energy transfer, like an x-ray will ionize uh, those neutral gases. Uh, the neutrons, there has to be some energy transfer there um, that might not be as charge-based and the like. Um, so that's what I had today. These are the chapters or sections. Again, chapter five of this leak book is like all over the place, but these are the specific two sections about neutrons and x-rays. Uh, and then in the scoop book, chapter 12 is all about x-rays. Chapter 32 is um, about radiochemical methods. So it's a specific section in there about neutron methods. Um, so any questions? Anything else? Okay. Well, I'll see some of you guys later this week. Some of you guys next Tuesday. Thanks.